Let me turn over the program to our Speakers Bureau Chair, Sasha Vanosky. Sasha, over to you. Thank you, Dick. Our speaker today earned uh, an MBA from Harvard Business School, as well as an honorary doctorate of science in biophysics from Ursinus College. She's a life sciences entrepreneur, independent investor, and corporate board director. Uh, she founded Patients' Right Advocate as an advocacy organization for the American public and employers seeking to greatly reduce the cost of healthcare and coverage. In the 90s, she founded the pioneering cord blood stem cell banking company, Biocord. In 1993, she served as a CEO. In 2000, uh, she co-founded the cellular medicine company, Viascell, of, wi of which Viacord subsequently became a division. She's the former Speaker of the House appointee to the Health Information Technology Advisory Committee. Please welcome Cynthia Fisher. Thank you so much for uh, that uh, kind introduction. I, and, and it is an honor and pleasure uh, to be a guest speaker uh, with your Rotary organization. And I can, I can have a, a happy dollar announcement, I guess, to say that I am now joining you all as of a couple of weeks ago as a Florida resident. How about that? Uh, and I moved down from Boston, Massachusetts to Florida. Uh, and uh, it's a real honor to be here. And I will tell you that uh, Florida, uh, is very different than Massachusetts. It's actually handled this pandemic uh, quite well, uh, having experienced it in both states. Uh, and um, I uh, hats off uh, to the governor and to every town and community that is working fast and furiously uh, to issue vaccines and bring us back to a strong economy. Um, I also applaud your organization for its mission and its core values as both in uh, patriotism and in faith and in service um, of all of you. Uh, and am humbled and honored uh, to be here today. Um, I can also uh, share with you that I'm here to talk with you today about a subject near and dear uh, to our hearts uh, because as business owners, many of you and all of us individually have experienced our healthcare system. And uh, I founded an organization called patientrightsadvocate.org because throughout my professional career, I found and saw the brokenness was actually a system that is to first in its oath and creed to do no harm was actually financially harming our hardworking citizens and our, our citizens across the country um, through financial ruin. Uh, because too often, and in most cases actually, uh, we as the American consumers of healthcare, and let me define the consumers as the individual, our families, we as workers and our employers, and us as taxpayers. So the consumers of healthcare have been blind to no prices before we get care. And then oftentimes blindsided weeks and months later with outrageously overpriced medical bills that we never knew we had to pay. And getting uh, even insult to injury uh, is that we are responsible to pay those bills that we never knew the price by writing a blank check because we are held accountable for whatever the hospital system and the insurance companies and all the middle players choose to charge us. And then just try to have recourse. It's very difficult and sometimes next to impossible to remedy a bill that you never knew the price nor whether it was fair. Um, and so um, I went to Washington and founded an organization called patientrightsadvocate.org. And we've been working very uh, hard to work with 
the administration and with Congress, but primarily the administration to look at existing law and to seek uh, actual real healthcare price transparency, to know the real prices in healthcare before we get care and to enable a functional competitive marketplace in healthcare, just like we get every other place in our economy. There is absolutely no other sector of our economy that doesn't give us the price or a choice or let us benefit from knowing the competition. So I have good news to share with you today. And that is, is it's game over for hospitals and insurance companies having secret negotiated deals, keeping us in and all the middle players, private equity, et cetera, that has invested into this and to industry to keep us in the dark and to have gag orders and to keep the actual prices secret because this past administration issued forth looking at existing law and the law that was found, and there are four other laws that also support healthcare price transparency was actually the Affordable Care Act where patients have the right for the standard prices to be revealed to patients before we get care. And so um, this is a huge win for the American consumers because just starting this past January 1st, all hospitals are to post online their discounted cash prices, as well as all of their negotiated rates with the various insurance carriers. On top of that, starting January 1st of 2022, the insurance companies are to post online readily accessible in machine readable format, all of their negotiated rates so that we as employers and we as consumers, no matter where we get care outside of a hospital setting, whether it's a physical therapy visit or a lab or an MRI or even a chiropractor, wherever we get care where we may have coverage, we are to know the discounted cash prices and the negotiated rates starting 2022. But this year, it's starting in the hospital setting. So the big win is that the American consumers have won. And this is now our right to know before we go the actual prices in healthcare, the actual prices, so that we can save through our own choices of knowing the competition uh, and save for our prices of our colonoscopies or our MRIs or our knee replacements. Um, whatever and wherever we go in the years to come, we should see a functional competitive marketplace in healthcare. And right now is the very beginning of all of this. And it's a huge shift, right, to see the empowerment of the American consumer because we have not had this power. It's a behavioral shift, as you know, which takes time. But we do know from the experiences of the functional marketplace that we know already, let's use the example of a cash marketplace of plastic surgery the costs of Botox injections to reconstructive plastic surgery have gone down by nearly half since those prices are classically published and cash rates and competitive. We've seen the same thing happen with LASIK eye surgery where those prices have come down by nearly half. And I think what we also know, and we were so advantaged as uh, patientrightsadvocate.org, we went with a film crew throughout the country to listen to the plights of patients' burdens. And we also sought solutions and we captured it in film and we captured it through relationships. And what we found is that employers were able to change the game in healthcare by taking control of their costs, just like they do for every single purchasing item for their business. How? They got to know the prices in advance of care and the real actual discounted cash prices. And the employers that have been changing the game in healthcare have contracted directly 
direct contracting at those discounted cash prices, eliminating all the administrative waste and oftentimes the middle player by self-insuring and in seeking to steer their employees to price transparent quality surgical centers and price transparent, um, price transparent direct primary care physicians as well. So doctors and surgical centers and cancer centers that will give you a bundled complete discounted cash price. So these employers we had found on average were saving 30 to 50% from their prior years insurance coverage for care for their employees. That's a huge savings. And in fact, across the country, Dr. Larry Van Horn from Vanderbilt University, a health economist with Art Laffer, who had the National Medal of Honor as a, you know, he did the Reaganopics and economics and the Laffer curve. Art was involved as well to look at the data historically. What is the discounted cash rate compared to the negotiated rates from the insurers? And what they found by looking at facilities, hospitals, same surgical teams, same facility, same MRI, same type of surgery, nearly 40% lower than the negotiated rate, the lowest negotiated rate in that same hospital, that same facility in the same market. So when you look at, when we have price discovery of these discounted cash prices, and we see the various negotiated rates, that's a race to the top on quality and a race to the bottom on pricing. Because in every other sector of our economy, we know that a true competitive marketplace improves quality. And what we saw, for example, with the airlines, quality improved once they disclosed their prices after 1978, people were free to see prices. In real dollars, the cost of the airlines and to fly came down by 50%, 50% in real dollars in today's cost to fly. Quality improved, safety improved, and hundreds of millions of people had broader access to fly. Of course, things are shifted a bit with this pandemic, but when my daughter, uh, who already had COVID and has the antibodies, is going to fly from Florida to California uh, this weekend for $30 across country. We know that a supply and demand and a free market does work, that uh, someone can fly from Fort Lauderdale to uh, LA for $30. That's the free market working, and we see that working in healthcare. So the good news for all of you uh, and all of your families and your businesses is this has been a monumental shift which empowers the consumer to know before we go the real prices in healthcare and allow us to shop to drive down the cost of not only our care but we feel very firmly that in time in the years to come the collective empowered consumer will greatly reduce the cost of coverage as well. So no longer will small businesses who have especially been harmed, let me give you an example, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, whose members are retail centers, restaurants, construction workers, uh, builders. A lot of these businesses have seen over the past 10 years, double digit increases in their coverage, and then they have to go to high deductible plans. And how do you shop if you didn't know the prices on your high deductible? This is changing. So it's game over for the shrouds and curtains of opacity. And it's game on for the sun, the Floridian sunlight to be shown so that any of us, if somebody's on Medicare Advantage even, and you've got a supplemental plan, you should be able to lower your outside costs and eventually lower that additional plan. So when we look at the advantages to businesses, I can tell you the people we took forward to Washington were people like Harris Rosen from Orlando. Now he established Rosen Care for his employees and saved substantially that he got it down to nearly 8,000 an employee and their family 
to come into their medical clinics. But he also was able to direct contract for all of their hotel workers, 6,000 workers, direct contract for primary care, direct contract for surgical uh, surgery, so that he could save for his employees. These savings were so significant that since Harris Rosen of Rosen Hotels and, and Rosen Care established, he believes in the 20 some years that he's been doing this, his organization saved over $400 million collectively. What is that compounded? Well, I think those monies, as Harris would say, helped him save his business through this pandemic thus far to have that kind of cash back into the business and back into his employees' pockets. Because even his uh, high-risk diabetics and employees that might have had HIV and complicated drugs, he was able to save by going directly with Walmart and reimbursing his employees by using the Walmart pharmaceutical purchasing, which saved his firm substantially. So much so that um, I think it's the Osceola School District asked the Rosen folks to help them save their money. And they're estimating now that um, his team is administering this school district's um, healthcare plans, they estimate that in the coming in the coming couple of years that it'll be a total of six million dollar savings. Well, that's money in the bank, not having to increase taxes for this school district, and and that's a real win. We saw DeSoto Hospital. We also took their story to um, Washington, where by direct contracting with primary care, direct primary care providers who were able to provide testing at $6, which would otherwise have been hundreds of dollars and have 24 seven access to primary care docs, as well as directly contracting for surgeries. This own hospital saved their employees in the first year $1.2 million for their company. Well, that means more money to put into bonuses and wages. It's a real win for the American people. And we knew before this pandemic that there was another pandemic because many Americans were facing bankruptcy and medical debt financial ruin. And 64% of Americans before the pandemic were fearful to get health care because of fear of financial uncertainty, not knowing if going to the doctor or the hospital would put them in financial ruin. So they delayed care oftentimes until they went into crisis. Well, this is all able to change, but we are gonna to have to advocate strongly because the hospitals right now are, are by mandated by law and we won in the courts because the hospitals sued to not show prices. And our organization wrote the amicus brief supporting the Department of Justice that this is the American right to have freedom and liberty to know before we go the actual prices and to be in charge of our health as well as our wealth. Well, we won in the courts back in July, they appealed. And I have great news to share with you is that we won in the appellate courts December 28th for the American consumer to be informed and that the First Amendment does not protect gag orders and secret deals to be not revealed to the consumer. So the judges, the three court panel judges of which Merrick Garland, who is now going to be attorney general for the Biden administration, um, basically ruled to say, no, consumers are to be well informed by hospitals on real prices, not not informed or ill informed. So congratulations, this is a huge win, but we are going to have to advocate very strongly ourselves because right now uh, we see cost estimate tool, estimator tools and uh, files that are put up online, but not really easy to use yet for us consumers but it is our right to know. And when you go, I can only encourage that as a collective, it's people like you that will make a difference to keep this right in the years to come. And Biden has stated in his manifesto that healthcare price transparency is something that will embrace and be part of the unity of our country. So it's up to us to keep this right. And uh, thank you for this time. Thank you, Cynthia. That was a very, uh enlivened talk, it certainly uh, shows that it's something near and dear to your heart. And I, I think it's timely as well. Uh, let me start with the questions and ask you 
Uh, one of the, the issues that's often not addressed, and, and it, it's an elephant in the room, is the cost of drugs. Our, our pharmaceuticals, we pay far more than for the same drug than is paid in Canada or in the uh, European economic community. W will this transparency have an impact on that? Absolutely, because what happened in the final rule, in the insurance rule, is that drug pricing transparency was also put in so that the insurers covering at whatever negotiated rate for those drugs absolutely is mandated to be disclosed starting January 1st of next year. So under the umbrella of price transparency, HHS Secretary Azar put in that the insurance rule, and it was also the treasury as well as the Department of Labor, that we need price transparency in drugs. Now, I know it has been very hardly hard worked on, on making sure that most favored nation or different avenues to go um, for drug pricing. And it, it is really almost criminal that the American taxpayer and the American uh, workers and Americans as a whole, as patients, we pay an inordinate share uh, far higher than our other developed countries and, on, uh, and um, other countries in our, our, uh, around the globe. So it's time for a fair price. And the only way we can know a fair price is to have transparency. And um, that's the first step. That's okay. the first step. Thank I think the first person who uh, reached the chat box was Denny Career. Denny, do you have a question for Cynthia? Are you saying that the amount of money a company can save when self-insuring overwhelms the amount of money they're going to be fined by the government because they are self-insuring? Um, absolutely. If companies, this, those that are self-insuring and direct contracting, and you can go to our website, patientrightsadvocate.org, and there are companies like Sendera, um, Stauffer's Grocery in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. They were, you know, when you look at these savings, Oftentimes they're even more significant. I'll give you an example like Stauffer's. They went to this price transparent model of direct contracting. And when we went to their beautiful Mennonite grocery store uh, in Lancaster, we interviewed their employees and one of their employees shared, let me give you the difference. She went to OSS Surgical in York, Pennsylvania. You can look online at their prices. I think a knee replacement was around $15,000 at the time. All in, whether you're a cardiac patient, a diabetic, or a healthy adult who needs a knee replacement, it's the same price, one patient, all patients. Compared to a local Lancaster hospital where her husband got a knee replacement under his care and coverage, her knee replacement was $15,000. She did great. And that included all her physical therapy, occupational therapy, et cetera. He went and his surgery alone was over $75,000. Now think about what that means to Stauffer's. Do you know what they did? They rewarded her with her choice. She had the choice to go to the local Lancaster hospital or she drove an extra hour and went to York's OSS Price Transparent Surgical Center. Well, they rewarded her with a $2,000 bonus for making that choice, saving her and the company money. Then they had more in the pool to hire more people and grow their business and eventually add to wages. This is amazing. This is, but it does take work and it takes, you know, an honest third party administrator who's not actually paid on commission uh, by one of the big blues or United or Aetna on their plans that you need an independent third party administrator who will work for you on a flat fee consulting basis to help you shop. Um, and these are these are huge changes. Thank you. A follow, yeah. a follow up question on that: Why is it that the government is fining the self insurers? That seems un American to me. Well, um, I will tell you just as an outsider here to Washington, who spent a little time there, the power and the of the law, lawyers and the lobbyists of the healthcare industrial complex. Uh, sometimes the sky grows dark <laughs> with their time and, and monies uh, spent uh, with Congress 
and with government. And it really takes all of us uh, to work hard as almost a, 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 our own social justice campaign for small businesses and medium sized businesses and even large and all of us individuals um, to keep this right. Uh, to in really real prices do matter to have a real functional market. Yeah, it's another case of the government choosing winners and losers. <laughs> Which side are you on? Um, our next question uh, has to do with administrative costs and comes from Jim. Jim? First, let me say I applaud your efforts and I thought your presentation was fantastic. Um, this is just my perception that this is a very complicated problem that resembles an onion where you have multiple layers that need to be pulled away, but I commend you for starting somewhere at one of the most basic and important points in, in all your hard work. Uh, with respect to the medical professionals that are present in our meeting, I don't know of anyone not in the field that would argue that medical costs are out of control and therefore very frightening. Uh, my view is that much of the cost escalation in medical in the medical field are due to regulatory burdens, um, liability insurance, and overzealous players in the in the legal field, shall we say? Um, is there any attempt to try to identify kind of generically what those costs are and what percentage of the total cost that you pay that go toward these? Um, overhead costs that the, the, the small practitioner um, has to pay. And he's just passing or she's just passing it on to their patient. But, but that is a huge part of, I think, our cost relative to what, say, somebody in another country is going to pay. They don't have the, um, the squads of lawyers that go around and represent the pharmaceutical firms or the big medical manufacturers or the liability insurers. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Jim, and thank you. Um, first of all, I applaud the physicians and, and uh, that are on your uh, membership uh, here because, you know, especially in this pandemic, they're the front line and you're the ones that actually went into medicine to, for the ideal of delivering the best of healthcare uh, and quality of life and saving lives um, for your patients. And that administrative burden that you asked about and the question really was, well, how much cost is built into that? There was a Journal of American Medical Association, a JAMA article uh, that came out in 2019 that looked at the administrative waste in uh, care. And it looked across the hospital system, but also private practices. And at at the very minimum, the administrative waste was valued at 25% of those costs were totally uh, unnecessary administrative waste. Well, when you look at our gross domestic product where healthcare is approaching 20% of our GDP and it's approaching $4 trillion a year in this year, as estimated to be spent on healthcare. That's nearly a trillion, 25% of waste is nearly a trillion dollars of waste. So we believe firmly that price transparency and price discovery is the foundation. But as you said, there are other uh, hurdles that we need to overcome in non-competitive practices. And we're also fighting hard for the American independent doctors because we believe with price transparency, when, when those that have left the system, like the direct primary care docs and these independent surgical centers, they have lowered the prices substantially. And what's happened to their insurance rates, what's been really amazing when we talk to Keith Smith at Oklahoma Surgical, who's been price transparent for 24, uh, 12 years, they've only lowered their prices to the patients in the four times they've changed prices. And they said, and Texas Free Market Surgical told us the same. He said, you know what happened, Cynthia? We as doctors found that our insurance rates went down for liability. And we went to the actuarials and we're like, why are you giving us such a savings? And they said, well, we realize that when you hire an anesthesiology team and a radiology team, and you have a price that you're gonna stand behind, one patient, all patients, 
you're going to manage your cost and you're going to make sure you have the A team. And so we know that your quality is superior compared to, to your brethren that get paid on how long somebody's anesthetized and how long they're in the OR. That's not good for a patient. So when you can drive down costs rather than optimize uh, billing by time and clock, uh, and rather you're optimizing on care, uh, they're finding that these administrative fees are coming down and they're able to pass those savings on. Our next question comes from Catherine and is uh, addressing the problem of in-network versus out-of-network. Catherine? Yeah, so I understand that it's a common problem and it's one that I've experienced where a patient can go to an in-network hospital and, you know, unbeknownst to them, they can be seen by an out-of-network physician and then get substantial bills after that. Um, is there any plan to address transparency there? Yes, absolutely. So um, thank you for asking. That's a sophisticated question because you, so many people have been quote unquote surprised that they thought when they went in for their colonoscopy or they went in for their surgery that the anesthesiologist or the radiologist because they work there or even the emergency room doc uh, would have been in network, but in <laughs> out of network. Why? Well, private equity firms have bought up many physician practices. And unfortunately we have this capital capitalism based system where the power is lopsided only to industry. And so without the consumer having price transparency or knowing what the all in bundled price would be for that surgery, uh, these doctors groups have been able to bill separately, oftentimes way above what an insured negotiated rate or a discounted cash rate would be. So um, price transparency actually when it goes system-wide and the pressure to compete uh, will help cure that ill. Because why would you, when you could get a quality surgical team across the street, I can give you Boston at the Beth Israel versus going to the Brigham, and you know that you could save $3,000 or $5,000 um, when you see these prices, that will also help be the cure for surprise billing. Now, Congress did just pass a law uh, in this last, um, a budget act that happened called the Surprise Billing Act. But that was really an, for the private equity guys own practices that are out of network with the insurance companies to bring a whole new legal firm group together in white space called arbiters that will go behind the scenes and arbitrate on those outrageous balance bills so that we don't have balance bills. That's the win in the future. That's gonna start 2022. But the problem is you've now added one more mouth to feed at the trough, uh, negotiating lawyers between the high priced uh, uh, out of network folks and the insurance companies. When in fact, if you just had price transparency right now today from everyone, um, let uh, the free market work and uh, the consumer shop with their feet and online. But you know this is the first step and we're fighting the industry complex to actually create a functional market. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Let me remind everyone that Cynthia's organization website is patientrightsadvocate.org. And uh, it's actually www.patientrightsadvocate.org. So if you're interested, you can go on that. Our next question comes from Chris Whitney. Thank you. I just want to share a quick story. My wife um, has recovered, I guess, from breast cancer. And one of the follow-up things she has to do periodically is to get an MRI. When the, her copay for the MRI was like $600. Oh, and she was making a big fuss and pushing it off. Her doctor at Advent Health, who had ordered the procedure or the, the scan at the... Um, MRI down on South Campus said, just go in and tell them that you'll pay cash. You don't have an insurance. They'll give you a cash price. When she did that, this is Florida Hospital to Florida Hospital. It went from $500 copay to a $250 charge. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That was bizarre. That is why the employers insisting on knowing those discounted cash rates. And the problem is if you go in and you say you have insurance, 
They won't even tell you the cash rate. So you have to go in and say, no, no, I'm not using insurance. No, no, I'm not using insurance. I want that discounted cash rate. And you are absolutely right. And what we see in Boston, we see the same thing uh, where it's a $250 cash price from the same facility at, and, and at Children's Hospital, they'll charge you $2,500 for that MRI. And like your wife's experience, you'll have an outrageous copay. Why? Why do we have this huge price variability? Because without knowing prices between the insurers and the hospital, <laughs> price gouging, it's really overcharging. And so now this is really, this is the secret. This is the goal, this is the gold for us to save our hard earned dollars and put more in our wallets and our savings. And look, it's gonna be up to us to like your wife to work really hard to do that because wouldn't you rather to take all that savings and just put it in your account for your children and your grandchildren. Um, uh, again, this revolution in healthcare is gonna be up to the consumer. Cynthia, since I um, have the, the uh, mic, let me ask you a, a little bit about Medicare. Uh, Medicare, when, when you look at the co-pays uh, and ev everybody on Mer Medicare comes through either basic or like in Florida, a uh, uh, Medicare Advantage plan, and I'm always astounded when I look at my copay and the full price of the drug supposedly might be $78. The discount brings it down to $11 and I pay more than half of that as, as my copay. In a couple of cases, I check my copay against the, the price for the generic in Canada and my copay was 120% of the price of the generic in Canada. Is, is that fit with your experience in doing your research? Yes, uh, your experience is not atypical. It's absolutely uh, something that people have found that oftentimes, uh, you know, their copay will be higher than what you would pay at other countries. The other uh, factor that we'll see is the drugs, let's use uh, Prilosec or like on Parazol, um, the payment of your copay may also be much, if you get it through your prescription, may be much higher than what you would do if you got it over the counter. And um, this is highway robbery. Uh, and it's really going to be transparency, prices in prices and competition that's gonna help drive that down. Now there are new tools like GoodRx that uh, have coupons and, and services to show you where based upon your geographic location, you can get the most least expensive drug fill, um, but we need more of them and we need more competition in, in the drug world. So after we win at price transparency, we're gonna keep on going, but uh, the orphan drug um, law has been problematic because it allows pharmaceutical companies to price what they may and whatever they want, have no competition uh, uh, and have fast track their drugs, but uh, keep away a competitive barrier and have long-term patent protection. And, and then many of them come out almost at a million dollars for a drug. Um, th this is outrageous. We need competition. We'll keep working, but let's win on price transparency first. <laughs> and let, let me follow up on a question that uh, Catherine Conroy had about inpatient uh, or in-network and out-network. Do you see uh, the transparency actually collapsing the difference between in-network and out-of-network net, because of, of the price of uh, published prices? Yes. And I, I, we, that when you say collapsing, I'm going to say that we see that there will be a great opportunity for reduction in costs of care and coverage through such transparency with the out of network and the in network. And let me explain why. I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna go back to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. A postman and his wife had a child who needed to go to the NICU after being born and was visited by a neonatologist that was out of network. Just for that visit, one day and the second day, all in an hour of time of a, a neonatologist, 
$80,000 not covered, $80,000. How does a postman who doesn't even make $80,000 pay for that hour of time with a neonatologist? Well, when we see price transparency and see the price gouging in that Lancaster hospital, and you see these types of things and people can report it on mobile apps like we have on Yelp and uh, Orbitz or uh, Expedia and Kayak that we can shop for airlines or we can see um, the consumers empowered when we buy items in retail. We, when we can have those mobile apps and those tools and that aggregation online, uh, we're empowering the consumer to avoid price gougers and overcharging and also help eliminate 10% of the hospital charges are fraudulent to be able to eliminate that fraud. So take out that administrative waste and take out the fraud and take out the price gougers. Yeah, that's a huge, huge savings. You, you would think that they would hardly have enough gall to charge $80,000 for a couple of visits. Uh, that, that is not only price gouging, that's highway robbery. Highway robbery is being committed every day, Richard, and in, 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 I'm sorry, you know, by Dick, but I can also share with you in 21 states in our country during the pandemic, hospitals sued their patients for medical debt for these types of bills, this type of price gouging, ruined their credit, took them into financial ruin, and then put them into courts. And we ended up in court in Fredericksburg, Maryland, where Mary Washington Hospital was suing their patients. Only 28,000 people live in the county in, in the five years that they started suing, 21,000 people in Fredericksburg, Virginia were sued by the hospital. Okay, these are $14 an hour workers who were price gouged. And every piece of that bill is a separate day and a $75 court fee. But we saw University of Virginia was suing in Carlsbad, New Mexico. We went out there to do a 60 minutes interview and we found that the judge herself was sued by the local hospital for medical debt. You can't make this up. This was happening during the pandemic at a time when the hospitals got a $200 billion bailout by us, the taxpayer, and they're still suing patients for medical debt on prices they never knew they were going to see. And Dick, can I ask her, she probably can decide on this one urban myth I've heard out there on the issue of uh, doctors and hospitals getting more if they're identified as a COVID patient. I figure you know. Yes. What's the answer? Yes. I heard 15% is what I heard or something if it was identified as such. And so you had one side of the political spectrum going, well, can we really trust the numbers? Yes, and in the beginning, uh, because there weren't enough tests, uh, you didn't have to have confirmatory testing to okay. get up, up charge on a COVID patient. So the first thing they did is uh, came up with a billing code for an increased amount for COVID patients. And as a follow-up, how, how much of our medical cost has to do with the fact that we pay our doctors, tend to pay them quite a bit more than most other countries do? I was shocked to find how little they pay doctors in England. And are we getting the cream of, you know, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, and all these other places? And is our medical care that much better? Is it worth and how much is that additional cost that our, we pay our guys better, our people, men and women? Um, Bob, I haven't seen um, data to answer your question. So I don't know that factor. I can tell you that our medical school system is broken as well. We have to import doctors because we do not allow enough of our own good Americans, uh, students to uh, become med students and funnel them into our system. So um, our, but our teaching hospitals can charge substantially more as an academic center, even on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and they have the ability to charge more because they're an academic center. So even that is problematic, which we believe price transparency and care will show you that um, why not have your employees have uh, their babies at a hospital where you know you can have the hospital fee all in be $5,000 versus $45,000 a mile away at a substantially large active right. medical center. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Ern had a question. Ern, are you online? 
Uh, Cynthia, uh, have you all actually focused uh, a part of your thing on actual cost analysis versus pricing? We have not looked at the actual baseline costs compared to what the price is. Um, we believe that's really the role of the hospital or the surgical center or, or the physician's group. Um, what we are looking for is those that can aggregate the data of the pricing and allow consumers to have mobile apps on their phone based upon our GPS locators to find where, where we could go and what price we could get. I mean, can you imagine when we can Uberize healthcare such that I could pull up on my phone just like Uber. Okay, I need that MRI just uh, like a gentleman earlier had spoken about his wife's um, MRI for, her, for breast cancer, for getting those MRIs. So why not look at trying to get a cheaper amount in the off hours, you know, why not send your college student who's up until 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. anyway to go in the middle of the night and get it for half price? And, it, you know, that, that machine's manned anyway. So, uh, you know, use excess capacity. Uh, and so we can see uh, a, a lower uh, cost uh, and you can see competition. So we have not seen any entrants yet. We've been talking with Google. We've been talking with others to say, please come in and aggregate this data that's now out in flat files so that consumers can have these tools. But we don't have the cost information uh, versus what the prices are. Well, I think there's one other question, Cynthia, and that is the difference between emergency medicine versus selective cosmetic surgery and other kinds of selective. I can very easily uh, not, uh, uh, by background, I spent a good half of my working life as a Navy officer watchdogging the various industries buying weapon systems for the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And we had to be very careful about where we were, uh, we had to have versus what we chose to have. And we were looking also always at the question of quality and the question of effective testing to prove that what we got as a product was useful. These very same techniques and procedures, I, I know you understand that very well, apply to every industry, every enterprise. And it seems to me that we need to identify who independently is watchdogging because uh, I, I found that uh, a good bit of the time, we would have folks within the government dealing under the table. And I, I had to send some people to jail, frankly, as an, as a, uh, because of our own, our own humanity, in that if I pay you enough money, you're going to be tempted to pass me a little extra stuff, whether you're a deputy sheriff or a contractor working for the U.S. government. Well, you know, it's, it's a, a, a sad state where uh, when greed runs amok, is it not, Aaron? I mean, it's, it's it, earn, right? Earn, excuse me. Um, I, you know, what we know thus far is the watchdog for our healthcare system is within HHS and the Inspector General's office. Uh, and we do know they're overwhelmed. We also know with even price transparency, right now the rule is a de minimis fine. It's $300 per hospital per day, not per patient that can't get a price. So it's de minimis. So many of the hospitals have choose, chosen to take the fine. There are those that are stepping into the, li into the light and we have not yet seen a very friendly way to see the actual data, but we will shine the light when we do. And actually we're looking at considering setting up a watchdog organization because there, to our knowledge, one does not exist for the accountability of costs and pricing and quality. Um, and we have it everywhere else. And we know with the empowered consumer and the empowered of transparency to this uh, visibility into quality and price, um, it, does, it, does, it will drastically change uh, the industry from consuming what is today. What is today, one day in every five. When you look at 25% is waste and tw nearly 20% of our healthcare, 20% of our gross domestic product is spent on healthcare. 
Well, that means we're working one day a week just to pay health care. I have a question for you, Cynthia. This is Jim. Uh, in regards to the, uh, I guess I guess it's when you have a good doctor and he's in a good good plan and you're doing well. That's one thing. But who's going to be checking the quality of the services that are provided through the healthcare system? Well, there was also part of this price transparency rule of quality section uh, and a billing section. Uh, which we were really encouraged about. And that was to really have quality metrics. You know, what is the standard operating protocol? What is the standard SOP? I mean, you have it in any manufacturing business where you have iterative improvement and you report on quality. And what we do know is the price transparent surgical centers that are out there have started to also report their quality and they show their infection rate. They show their mishaps. And they also they show their percentages of successes. And then, you know, I think it's also going to be a free and transparent system where patients blog, patients write comments, patients rate their uh, outcomes. Really, it's the outcomes data and the quality of life data after receiving care that's going to make that difference. So, again, price discovery will usher in quality transparency, we believe, and um, and then you have choice and competition. Thank you so much. I appreciate that answer. You're welcome. Well, I think um, I, again, I can tell you we've had we've had good presentations and great presentations. You were awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Rick. What a great what a great experience that today has been. I will edit this this afternoon and uh, this evening. I will send through Sasha. I'll send you the video of everything with the Q and A and everything, and I just can't tell you how how happy we are to have spent the time with you, and we really appreciate everything. And Sasha, great job, uh, great job getting Cynthia to be our speaker. So, thank you. Let's take one more question, and then I'll take a minute to close the meeting, and we'll come back to you if you can stay with us a few more minutes. Uh, our uh, next uh, speaker is Ali Phipps. Ali? Um, thank you, Cynthia, for all your information. I, I have a similar anecdote. I'll keep it brief. I had a serious foot fracture uh, some years ago, and I happened to be uninsured at the time. And um, so I went to the doctor, and he actually shopped around for surgery center. He shopped for anesthesiologist and everything. And uh, it was like 6,000 bucks uh, all in, including all the follow-up visits that went for months and months and months. And then, so fast forward to when I'm insured, I have to have all those appliances out. I had like uh, nine screws and two plates, had to have them all removed. And just, just the uh, physician's bill under insurance was 6,000, not counting the hospital, the surgical center, the everything else. So just typical. Thank you, Ali. If I may leave you with one little gift. Can you imagine that instead of putting our monies as employers and individuals into insurance plan, that gets almost burned in the fireplace if we don't use that, right? Many people are adults are healthy for years and only tap into their deductible. Can you imagine if we had a, the ability for our employers to give us a tax advantage, fully funded amount of what otherwise we would have in this plan? and that it would be our own personal savings and that we would maintain ourselves like we maintain our car, paying cash, directly paying cash and have monies available in this plan compounding over years of the life of an individual from the time they're a baby to compound over the time. Right now, the average spend on healthcare per person into these plans is $12,000 a year per person in this country. So if, if you were able to see that money compound from birth all the way through and have a fully funded ability to have that be savings for retirement or for medicine or to give to your children or grandchildren, tax free, tax advantage, rather than have it be depleted and not used other than for insurance company gain. That could be huge. And that would really use healthcare potentially as a health savings account fully funded as a plan can you imagine what that would do to our economy? It would actually use 
healthcare to create a savings economy in the US. So that's what we're going to work on. We're going to keep awesome. going. That, I take it that's expanding HSAs because that's what HSAs are. The problem is I, most of the plans I've ever had won't allow an HSA, yet it's the greatest thing out there. Bingo. So we have to go to the Treasury and the Biden administration and whatever administration is beyond that. But God willing, we get it done in the Biden administration. But if it's the Treasury that allows us through IRS rulings, to be able to fully expand an HSA and not be limited not be limited at all and let it be a fully funded plan from birth on. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation and insights. We uh, really learned a lot and were pleased to see that not only you are, are you very enthusiastic, but you've obviously been very effective. So thank you. Uh, I'll remind all the members that next week, our program on January 21st is April Ranger of C-SPAN, and she will talk about the efforts to keep bias out of C-SPAN and how that works. Uh, in two weeks, we will have Gary Hutman from Metro Plan Orlando with an update on the transportation plans in Central Florida. So since we are a business club, let me remind everyone, do business with Rotarians. And now, uh, Rich, for the four-way test. Of the things we think, say, and do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? So let me remind everyone, be safe, be well, be involved, be a Rotarian. Our meeting is now adjourned.